And so we're, we're back in Revelation 8. Last week we were still in Revelation 8. And I talked about the prayer of the saints and the effect it has on the judgment of God. And so, uh, so I didn't feel like we were done with this chapter. I want to go back and, and talk about at least a few of the, the uh, judgment, the trumpet judgments that are poured on. And as we go through this, uh, especially after, after we get into uh, chapter 14, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with these different judgments a little bit differently, but I mean, a little bit more uh, detailed. But what I want to talk about tonight or this afternoon is the what I'm going to call the baptism of fire. And it'll take me a while to explain all this and get, get to that, that point. But you probably noticed right away a lot of those uh, judgments that came upon the earth had to do with fire. You know, a lot of fire. And the Bible sp- speaks a lot about that. In fact, this morning in Sunday school, I uh, did a wor- kind of a word study, uh, not obviously dealing with all the times the Bible talks about fire, because that would have been a long study, but particularly where the fire has to do with the judgment of God. And that's a lot. There's a lot in the Bible. Of course, we had to narrow it down a little bit, but, uh, but that fire and what it has to do with the judgment of God coming out. And of course, the Bible says that in Hebrews, it says God is a consuming fire. And so uh, it's kind of an interesting study. But I want to talk about that before we get back to the text here in Revelation and we read those. I want to talk about the word baptism for a second. And obviously, uh, you know, a couple of the messages on Thursday nights has been in regards to water baptism, which we obviously believe is biblical as what God uh, has for us to do as we accept Christ. And it's kind of like the next uh, step of obedience. And uh, but I want to try to get the water part of baptism out of your head just for a minute. OK, so that you can see what I'm talking about. And it's going to all come down to this being baptized by fire. OK, but I want you to get the water part out of your head for a minute and just think about the, what the word baptism means. Now, interesting, the King James translators left that word baptism. There really wasn't an English word. All right. There was like a uh, the Greek word baptizo or something like that. And so they just left it baptism. They didn't want to give it an English word because there really wasn't a, 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 an appropriate word. They, were, they didn't know really how to translate it, so they just left it. And, and there's several words in the King James that kind of just like formed this new word, you know, this new English word. And so uh, the best that we can explain, even looking at other sources uh, and, and how that word was used in English over time, the best that we can explain is uh, everybody understood there was a sense of immersion involved. Okay, Even the Catholic, if you go back to the earlier writings, Catholics know Baptism is by immersion. I know they sprinkle, but they understand what the word means. Okay, and it means to be submerged or immersed. You know, and I've heard some people make jokes about that. Like, yeah, well, maybe a better word is like dunking or dipping, because if you immerse something, you just hold them under the water. We want to come back up out of the water, right? <laughs> but anyway, so when we talk about water baptism, it, it makes sense. Okay, we're going under the water. We're not just sprinkling on them. Okay, but the reason that is significant. The word baptism is just talking about being like immersed into something, okay? So sometimes when we see it even in the Bible, it's not talking about that act of baptizing somebody in the water. That act of baptizing somebody in the water is just a picture of being baptized into Christ, for instance. I'll show you some of these verses. Okay, so let me show you what I'm talking about. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. Like I said, it'll be a little bit, but we will get back to... The text there in Revelation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, Moreover, brethren, I would not ye should be ignorant how that, our, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. I know it says sea. I know it, has, it says cloud and clouds have water in them. So you're thinking, hey, that's water baptism. But not necessarily. But the idea is that they're, they're in the sea, right? The parting of the Red Sea. They're surrounded by that. There's a cloud. There's, you know, so this idea of being baptized uh, wasn't necessarily talking about what we would think as far as water baptism. Go to this very famous Church of Christ verse, 1 Peter. I'm, I'm guessing. I don't know. I guess they use this one. Lutheran. 1 Peter chapter 3.
First Peter chapter three. Well, let's start with uh, let's start with eighteen. I think it'll it'll make the whole context make better sense. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which, okay, by uh, by the way, that's death, burial, or resurrection, right? He was uh, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Verse 19, By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Now pause right there, because this verse can get, this context here can get very confusing, because there's a lot of going back and forth uh, that we see here. And he's talking about the resurrection. Now he switched and talks about the time, and I won't even get into the whole doctrine behind it, but the time of preaching in Noah's days where the ark was being prepared. Okay, So now it says, look at verse 21, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth now save us. Now, where it says uh, eight souls were saved by water, how many in here think that water actually saved people in Noah's day? <laughs> no, water's what destroyed them. So he's not talking about that. I've heard some people say, and I, I would assume that that's probably right, saved by water, meaning you know they were saved and there was water there, they were by water, maybe that's it. Or something, there, well, maybe it's just this. Here's what I, I, I think could also be a very good explanation. They were saved by water. Not that the water saved them, but what happens when the water came? then the ark is what? Re kind of uh, not raised up. I don't want to say resurrected, but raised up, okay? So anyway, let's, uh, now, now it's going to get even more confusing. While the ark was preparing, that is, uh, the, uh, eight souls are saved by, by water, the like figure, whereunto even baptism doth now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, and everybody wants to just key in on the washing part. And so, hey, there was water and hey, there's washing. And they just make this mean all kinds of things. But first of all, that's a parenthetical, you know, that's, if you take off that part that's in the parentheses right there, if you take that out, it says, the like figure were unto even baptism doth now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what he was talking about at the start of this thing was the resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? So when he's talking about the, the baptism there, he's not talking about going into the water. In fact, what is the picture of what actually saves them when they're in the ark? So this whole picture is talking about is being in the ark. And what's that a picture of being in Christ? So when we're baptized into Christ, not talking about the water, but we are in Christ. Okay. And, that, and, and that's, that's important to understand. Often the Bible talks about how we're baptized into Christ or baptized of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And we're baptized into Christ at salvation. But then the water is a picture of that salvation. Hey, just like I was, I was uh, just like Jesus died, I was buried into His death, and just like He rose, I raised with, uh, up with Him in newness of life. Okay, it's a picture of being baptized into Christ. <laughs> Ephesians four five says that there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Okay, that faith, all these are talking about the same thing. There's one Lord that we put our faith in. There's one faith. There's one baptism. We're baptized into Christ. Look at Romans 6, popular scripture. Uh, some of these I know I'm not. I'm kind of rehashing because I know we've heard about that with some of the preaching on Thursday in regards to baptism. But Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death? Again, the water is not the subject here. Water... Baptism is a picture of that, and it is something we need to do. But the talk, the, the, this is talking about being baptized into Christ. As many as baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so even we also should walk in newness of life. Okay, and so I'm just trying to show you that when the Bible talks about baptism, it's not necessarily talking about water baptism at all, the, all these times. Okay, so, but the question I want to ask is, what is baptism of fire? Look at Luke chapter 316. Luke 316. It's kind of fun to look at all the 316s in the Bible. There's a lot of great ones. 
Luke 3.16. And of course, John's out there baptizing. All Judea is coming unto him. And we see that the, the people were there in expectation, verse 15 says. And, uh, and they're wanting to see if this is the Christ or not. And in verse 16, John answering, answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I cometh, the latcheth of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now there's a lot of things that have been added into this. I think doctrinally, charismatics, I'm sure, make the, the fire about, you know, the, the tongues of fire and speaking in tongues or something. I'm sure that because they turn all those verses into that. All right, but he's saying, you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. What is that? A spiritual baptism, right? That is literally being in Christ, being born again or born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit is being in Christ. Same thing. Okay, When you're born in the Spirit, you know, this is what we're talking about. Okay, but he says you'll be, he will baptize you with uh, the Holy Spirit and with fire. Why does he say fire? Anybody <laughs> ever thought about that? Let's look at the next verse, verse, uh, verse 17. Do you know that uh, this is also a military term people use sometimes? I mean, I'm, I'm sure they get it from here, but baptized with fire. Anybody ever heard that military? Baptized, how do they say, in fire or with fire? I can't remember. Basically, what they mean is that's their first time in war. They've been baptized in fire, right? <laughs> they go and there's, and there's, there's uh, gunshots and all. So baptized into fire or into war, okay? Uh uh, the next verse there, verse 17, says this. This kind of gives you the idea of the context of what he's talking about. He's going to baptize you uh, with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So it says, whose fan is in his hand, and he will, thr I'm, uh, he will thruly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into the garner. Fire unquenchable. Now, oftentimes the Bible talks about the fire of hell being that which is unquenchable, right? Uh, it, 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 and the worm dieth not. You've heard all the verses about that, okay? So, so he's, gonna, uh, he's going to burn with fire the chaff. Everybody in here, I'm sure, probably knows what chaff is, okay? And the, the best example I have in my head is roasting coffee. Amen? Anybody ever roasted coffee? It's a, it's a wonderful blessing. Okay. <laughs> you take the green coffee beans. Yeah, they're, they're originally green. You put them into whatever you're using to roast. What I do is an old popcorn popper, and I crank it, and the thing just kind of gets them, gets them turning in there until they start turning brown. And after they get a certain color of brown, they start popping almost like popcorn. Not quite as, as dramatic as popcorn, but they kind of pop, okay? And when they pop, what's happening is that husk that's around the bean is, is being left there. First time I found that out, I made a mess all over the kitchen you know, stove. <laughs> So, so then what I now do is I put it into a, what's that thing called? Colander. And I put it into that, you know, it's got, for you guys, a bunch of holes in, <laughs> metal bowl with a bunch of holes in it. And I go outside and I toss the beans up in the air and all the chaff just kind of is left behind, all that, those husks that, that popped up. And they just kind of fly off in the wind and the heavy stuff goes down. So that's the good stuff. Right. So oftentimes the Bible talks about chaff and it's saying it's separating. In, the, in, in this case, it's wheat. The wheat has this husk around it that, uh, or corn of wheat, the Bible will say. And it's got this husk around it. So what they actually do is put, uh, if they're just out in the field, they would actually take that wheat, kind of do this number, and all that chaff would, would be left behind. And so that chaff is really not good for anything except for it make really good kindling for your fire. And so the analogy is that what God's going to do at the end of the world is He's going to take that which is good and He's going to keep that. And that which is chaff, He's going to burn that up with unquenchable fire. Okay, And so when He talks about, I mean, that's the context here. He's talking about being baptized with fire, and then He talks about His fan is in His hand. You know what that, I mean, a fire is hot, but if you add a fan to that fire, you know, usually you've probably seen those things that, they push them like that and it blows air into the fire. It'll get red hot. I mean, just super, super hot. 
And so you think about when, when uh, they threw the Hebrew children into the fire and they said, make it 10 times hotter than, uh, than it ought to be or, or however that's, that's worded. Well, how do they get it hotter? Well, they must have blown air into it because that makes it hotter. And it's saying that Jesus has got the fan and he's going to make that hotter and hotter. Now, when we did that word study this morning in Sunday school, I'm thinking about the fire and, I, and it just dawns on me every once in a while that there are people out there that think, well, that's just so wicked. How could you serve a God? who's going to let people just burn in hell for all eternity and all that kind of stuff. And I, I agree that in my human flesh, I could be like, well, that's pretty extreme, don't you think? I mean, after all, we, you know, we will take somebody who is a, a I mean, not we, but take a, a pedophile or a mass murderer or whatever and just let them live their life in the prison cell. <laughs> you know what I mean? Thinking, oh, we got to be merciful. I mean, there are people out there that are totally like against the death penalty and stuff like that, and the, and they, they think they got to be merciful. But look, God is pure. He's just. Everything He does is right. right. And you can look at that and say, well, that just seems like an unholy God. That's because you're unholy. <laughs> that just doesn't seem like a nice thing to do. That's because you don't know righteousness. You don't know what wickedness. You really don't. You think that your sin's not that bad. And He's like, no, your sin the deserves eternal flame for all eternity, unquenchable fire. Now, praise the Lord, we don't have to worry about that because we can be justified through Christ. But the world will, many will, reject that, and they'll get their just reward at the end. And it's it's sad, but they're just like chaff. They're just going to be burnt in, in the fire. <clears throat> okay, so I think it's pretty safe to say that the baptism of fire is a reference to a literal judgment that will consume the world. Look at Luke 9, since you're in Luke still. Should be. When Jesus came the first time, the babe born in a manger, the one who, you know, was very compassionate, moved to tears, loved everybody. You know, he came and his disciples thought, even in John the Baptist, you know, when John the Baptist is baptizing, probably when John the Baptist said he's going to baptize with fire, he probably thought, like all these Old Testament prophecies, hey, when he gets here, you know, he's going to, he's going to, this is it, this is the end. He's going to bring his judgment and his, and his vengeance of flaming fire, you know, is going to come up. And so this is what they thought. But Jesus makes it clear, his whole ministry, I'm not here for that right now. I'm here right now to save and, the, and all his disciples are thinking, hey, I've read the Old Testament. I know what's going to happen when the Messiah gets here. They're thinking about what's going to happen one day. And they're just like, when's he going to, when's he going to like, you know, start taking the kingdom over? And, 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 and some of them are arguing over like what, what position they're going to get in the kingdom. You know, do I get to sit on your right hand or, or whatever? So Luke chapter 9, 1. The path. When the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? <laughs> I, just, I mean, Elias did. I love these guys' zeal. I mean, I really do. And, you know, they're reading these Old Testament stories and saying, man, I wish we could do that. I mean, this is, Jesus is right here, so he could probably allow us to do that. And so when they see these guys are rejecting Jesus, they're like, hey, should we call down fire? Can we do it now? Can we do it now? <laughs> they're wanting to get in on this, right? They call them the, the, the sons of thunder, right? These James and John, they meant business. Okay? And so... Uh, but Jesus says this because he didn't come to do that at the first time. He says, but he turned and rebuked them and said, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. He's like, I'm not coming here to condemn the world. I'm not coming here for the, the first time he came. I'm not coming here to cast judgment and, and, and to destroy and to, and to work vengeance of God. That's coming one day. Now is a time for me to be merciful and try to, try to get people to come to me for salvation. That's what Jesus was saying. And so obviously 
when he ascended up to heaven and he gave the, the commission to, the, to his disciples, we're still f trying to fulfill what Christ's purpose was whenever he was on earth. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. That's what our goal should be, seek and to save that which is lost. Not to cast judgment on people and to call down fire from heaven and try to you know, destroy people. That's not what we're doing right now. That's going to come, <laughs> rest assured. And that's going to be a very grievous day. So let's look at 2 Peter. We're almost back to Revelation. Let's look at 2 Peter. And this is the verse I like to call global warming. 2 Peter chapter 3. And look at verse 9. <clears throat> he's talking about people there'll be scoffers and mockers in the last day and, and they'll say eh, where's the you know where is the uh, coming of the Lord he's not here yet <clears throat> verse 9 the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but as long suffering to us word not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance but the day of the Lord that's always something that's attached to judgment that's all. The day of the Lord is not a good thing. The day of the Lord means, I mean, it is for believers in the sense that we're not going to be appointed to his wrath. So we know that if his, the day of the Lord comes upon this earth, we're going. <laughs> we're, we're out of here before he, you know, we're like Noah and his family in the ark. We're lifted up out of here and then he's going to destroy the world uh, like the flood. Okay. <clears throat> but this time it's going to be not flood, but fire. So here's what he says. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, like thunder, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Look for and hasting unto the coming uh, of the day of God, don't let someone try to tell you, oh, it's the day of God and the, the day of the Lord, two different things, different dispensation or something like that. Look, we're talking about the same thing, the same context, right? Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Praise the Lord, we won't be here when God, God pours out his fiery indignation upon the earth. Now, we will uh, go through, look at Revelation now, as we've already talked about, and this is why God shows in Revelation, He shows John these seven seals being opened up. And the six seals are things that are hereafter. This, these are the things that are going to be hereafter, uh, John. And basically, this is what we as Christians should be looking to, to, to happen. And that is that there's going to be tribulation, there's going to be people who are deceitful and they do signs and wonders and they try to deceive God's elect. This is something we're supposed to be watching for. There are people that are going to persecute Christians. You know, all who live godly shall suffer persecution. The, these are things that we right now should be expecting to happen to God's people because that's what was said. And so as these seals are open, we've gotten now to the seventh seal at the sixth seal, you know, the heavens, you know, are, are, are folded up. How does the song say? Uh, heavens be rolled back as a scroll. You know, that's right there in Revelation 6. Okay, and so, and so now everybody's fearful. You know, the Lord's come in the clouds. There's been earthquake, great, no, you know, great noise, as like, like Second Peter said. And, uh, and then there's now these, this judgment that's going to be cast upon the earth. So last week we talked about the censer, okay? And the censer uh, that the angel had, he got the fire from the altar, and then he added the prayers of the saints on that censer, okay? And it's like God's smelt that, that savor, you know? He smelt that incense, and it's almost as though it, like, piqued his wrath, you know, to think that these are the saints who are crying out to me because they've been persecuted, they've been treated badly, and they've been suffering, I mean, look, he doesn't want his children to suffer. 
It's not like He wants us to have, you know, He wants great things for us. But those things are yet to come. Those are, those are things that we're going to get in eternity, right? Those are things we're going to get in the millennial kingdom. Right now, we're not treated that well. We, sh we shouldn't be. If we're living godly, the world's going to hate you just like it hated Christ. And we should understand that that's going to come. And God's wrath is going to be poured out. He's going to be super, he's going to be furious with the world. And he's going to pour out that wrath upon the earth. And I want you to notice the first three seals. This is, the, this is where we're going here. I mean, not first, not seals. The first three trumpets. Okay, first let's look again at that altar. Eight, chapter 8, verse 5. Chapter 8, verse 5, uh, the censer. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightning and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. Okay, so now today we're only going to get through three trumpets. Uh, and then the rest of the trumpets won't really deal that much with fire. We'll talk about those next week, Lord willing. Okay, so let's look at the first trumpet. First trumpet, chapter 8, verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Now, I want to stop right there. Uh, I've got a lot of friends who, I call, them, I call them friends. I mean, you know, most of my friends are like Facebook friends, you know. Can you really call them friends? But, <laughs> but I like them. And they're preachers, but they don't believe, they believe in uh, pre-tribulation rapture, okay? And so when you try to explain to them that, hey, we're going to go through some tribulation and God's people are going to be persecuted and there's going to be great perils, there's going to be war, famine, all that kind of stuff. They're like, whoa, 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 we're not appointed unto wrath. We're not going to go through tribulation. Even though Jesus said after the tribulation of those days, right? But they'll say, uh, we're not going to go through any tribulation. But there's a distinct difference. I mean, so clear difference between what happened in those seals being opened and what happens once the seventh seal comes open. Because when those first seals are open, we're talking about persecution. God's people ever been persecuted before? Yeah. We're talking about a world war. Has there ever been a world war before? Yeah, not as bad as that world war is going to be, but there's been world wars. You know, there's been serious events like that. Has there ever been famous, a famine, depression, you know, rough times? Uh, obviously, there has been in our society. It's, it's going to happen again. It's going to be really bad. But that is completely different than God casting hailstones of fire and blood <laughs> and burning a third of the earth with fire completely different okay so one is uh if you compare scripture with scripture one is tribulation that the world or trouble that the world is putting on god's people and then the other is the tribulation or the trouble that god is going to put upon those people who are putting tribulation and trouble on god's people <laughs> does that make sense so he takes us out of here all the christians that are left and that remain dead in christ rise first and those that are alive and remain caught up uh, with them and then he's going to pour out his wrath on those who are left. And so this first trumpet, I mean, this first one is, is pretty intense, but they're, they're going to get even, even more so, okay? Hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and a third part of the trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Now the second, the second uh, I keep saying seals, the second trumpet. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. This big mountain on fire, and it cast into the sea. I don't understand exactly how the sea becomes blood, but this is what it says. And a third part of the creatures that were in the sea and had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, so here's a third trumpet. The third angel sounded, there fell a great star from heaven. We would call it, I, I'm guessing it's talking about what we would call a shooting star or a comet. Okay, Great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star was called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died 
of the waters because they were made bitter. And, uh, and then it goes on and talks about these other trumpet judgments that we won't necessarily uh, get to right now. Okay, so these are some serious judgments that are going on uh, upon the earth. Now, there are going to be some other things that are going to happen that aren't related to fire, but we're talking about like creatures crawling out of the pit and like stinging people and they're going to want to die, but they can't die. That's pretty intense. <laughs> this is the wrath of God being poured out upon uh, on, on those who are on the earth at that point. Okay, And the rest of the trumpets don't really deal with the fire that much. But then, obviously, we understand this. The final, the absolute final judgment of God. Revelation 20. Revelation 20, start with verse 10. And the devil that de deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Of course, the beast and the false prophet were, were, were cast into the lake of fire before the millennial reign. Satan was bound up for a thousand years and uh, he was let loose. That's another story we'll get to down the line. And then now he's going to be cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. And he shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And, and, and we know, I don't have the scripture written down in front of me, but we know that the Bible says that that, that place was never prepared for, for us, for any, any humans, right? It was prepared for Satan and his angels. Okay, but unfortunately we understand that those who reject Christ are going to have to, that's going to be their final fate as well. It says this, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from, whom, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Trust me, you don't want to be judged according to your works. You won't make it. <laughs> you won't make it. Look what I have, God. Look, this is good. I should get into heaven because of this. It ain't going to happen. Everybody, nobody's going to get to heaven based on their works. This is why when you knock on the door and you ask somebody, how do you know, what do you think you have to do to get to heaven? If they say, well, you got to believe in Jesus and then just, you know, be good. No, 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 no. You don't want to stand before God saying, hey, my, my righteousness should get me into heaven. You don't want to do that. <laughs> right? Only the righteousness of Christ is going to get you into heaven. Praise the Lord for that because we don't have to, uh, to fear these things. Okay, your name must be written in the book of life and it says there in verse 13, this, uh, uh, I mean, in verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, how do you get written in the book of life? Everybody in here understands salvation. You say, well, you got to be saved. Well, I would say this. You have to be <laughs> baptized in the spirit. That's how you get written. in the. You have to be born of the spirit. You have to be born again. You were born once in the flesh. You need to be born again of the Spirit. That would be baptized by the Holy Ghost. And so you're going to be baptized by the Holy Ghost or else you're going to be baptized by fire. Now here's a cool thing. If you're baptized by the Holy Ghost, let me read you some verses. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 6.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. God makes it so clear. When you're in Christ, you know, no man's going to pluck you out of his hands. When you're in Christ, you are sealed. You know, let's go back to the picture of the ark, which is a good picture of salvation by the Bible's definition itself. When they were in the ark, everybody got in the ark, had one door, by the way. There's only one door, you know, to salvation. That's Jesus. He said, I am the door. There's only one door, salvation. Guess what happened? They get on the ark. Guess who shut that door? God shut them in. You know, I, I don't know how they got out. That's been some speculation about that. I don't know how they got out. Uh, you know, I'm talking about after the flood. I guess God had to let them out. But, uh, but when they were on that ark, they weren't getting out. 
And water, I guess, wasn't getting in because they, they survived it. But you get the picture. What a wonderful picture. I mean, I believe that actually happened. But what a wonderful picture of our salvation. When you're in Christ, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You're not affected by the fiery judgment that's going to come upon the earth, right? But then after that, we will, thank the Lord, uh, have eternity in heaven. So the main application we need, because I believe everybody in here is probably saved and, uh, and sealed of the Holy Spirit, but what we want to do is we want to live like Christ did in His first coming. We want to make sure that anybody who's savable, and what I mean by that is it's not too late for them. They haven't rejected Christ to the point of, you know, being, being, having their heart hardened and being turned over to a reprobate mind. But they still, will, they still can receive Christ and will receive Christ if they only hear the gospel. Those are the people that we want to reach. And we want to uh, get them baptized in the Spirit and watered, but, <laughs> but not for salvation. Baptized in the Spirit so that they don't have to be baptized by fire. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for salvation and eternal security. And uh, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just give us that comfort. And when we go through any trials on this earth, any persecution, uh, rough times, help us to remember that our treasures are laid up in heaven and we don't have to fear those things. Uh, but we live, Lord, trying to please you because we love you because you first loved us. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless now. Uh, be with those who are soul winning this afternoon. And I pray you have your will and way in Jesus' name. Amen.